112 students. We're going to start chapter two, chemistry. Uh, now a lot of people wonder, why do we look at chemistry if we're studying biology? Well, the two are very much related. Everything that happens in biology is because of the chemistry of molecules. Uh, the molecules of life, how they function together, how they work, having enzymes in our body to do different processes, it's all based on chemistry. So we need to have at least a general understanding of chemistry to understand biology. Okay, so biology, it includes the study of life at many levels. So we start at the smallest level, the microscopic level. And then from there, throughout the ch uh, chapters, we'll work our way bigger, getting a larger and larger scale, seeing how everything fits together and works together. And so cells, the smallest portion that's alive, the way they function, based on chemicals, based on the chemistry between them. So when you look at the herd of uh, antelope grazing at a water hole, you'll see that going down, why they're drinking, why their brains are telling them they're thirsty, that's based on DNA chemistry. Okay, so first, what is matter? Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. So your mass is the same no matter where you are, whether you're on the moon or earth. Uh, your weight's going to be different based on the amount of gravity, though. And in general, matter is on the earth in three physical states. Uh, there can be more if you get very uh, technical, but we're just going to stick with three. So first, solid. If I asked you to point to something solid, you could. But what is it about its atomic structure that makes it solid? Solids, they have definite volumes and definite shapes. Their molecules are arranged in a very specific structure. Uh, liquids, liquids have a definite volume. You pour 100 milliliters of water into different shaped glasses, it's still 100 milliliters. Uh, but they have indefinite shapes, because it can change shape. Liquids change shape to fill their container. So definite volume and shape, definite volume, indefinite shape, and then gases are indefinite shape, indefinite volume. If you have an empty plastic water bottle, there's lots of air molecules inside there. You can squish that bottle. That decreases the amount of volume and changes the shape of that gas. But if you decrease the volume, there's going to be lots more pressure in there. It's related. Okay, so what is matter? Matter is composed of elements. Elements are substances that can't be broken down into other substances. Basically, they're the smallest part uh, that only looks like them. So if you look at the periodic table, you'll see lists of elements. Uh, hydrogen, helium, oxygen magnesium, calcium, carbon, all different elements. Okay, so like here's carbon, for example. And when you look at the periodic table, you'll see they're arranged in a very specific order. One, two, three, four, five, six. So carbon's atomic number is six. Its abbreviation is C, and its mass number is 12. So this is going to be based on how many protons there are. This is going to be based on how many... We'll look more in depth at that. Okay. So 25 elements are considered essential to life. Without them, we die. You can see that list here. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. Uh, and then you've got elements that you need at much lower levels. Those are called your trace elements, calcium, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, they're all important for overall cell charge. It's how we send electrical signals throughout our body. And they uh, help maintain normal levels of solutes, the levels of things dissolved. We'll look at that. Okay. So those top four make up 96% of the human body weight, whereas the trace elements, smaller portions. What we do in our body all the time is we combine elements together to form compounds. 
So compounds, examples NaCl, sodium chloride, that's table salt, H2O, water, C6H12O6, that's sugar, that's glucose. So what this means is when I look at this, this is a compound. It is a molecule that's made up of different types of elements. And here we've got six carbons combined with 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. Let's look at what the smallest level of each element is. So each element can be broken down into its smallest portion with all the different parts, and that's called an atom. So in an atom, you've got a middle part called the nucleus, and then other subatomic particles rotating around the outside. In the nucleus, you've got protons with a positive charge, neutrons that are neutral, they don't have any charge, and then around the outside you've got electrons, which are a negative charge. And this is very uh, downscaled. The electrons would really be much further away from the nucleus circling. And then, just to summarize, the atom is the smallest unit of matter, the smallest part of all the pieces, that still behaves like that element is all of the parts of that element. Okay, so let's get more into those subatomic particles. Protons are relatively large compared to electrons anyways. Electrons are 2,000 times smaller. And protons have a positive charge, whereas an electron is small, has a negative charge. And then a neutron is large and neutral. So you're going to have those heavy parts, the protons and the neutrons, in the nucleus. So all the heavy stuff is there. So when we're looking at our, when we're looking at the mass number of an atom, that's going to be adding the number of protons and neutrons together. Because the electrons are so much smaller, they really don't count for much of the mass at all. Yep. Nucleus, protons, neutrons. So this would be a mass of four, because oh, there's four heavy parts. And then two electrons circling on the outside. Different elements have different numbers of subatomic particles. That's what I was talking about before with the atomic numbers. That's the number of protons. And then the mass number, adding the protons and neutrons together. So for example, carbon has six protons. What we drew before in the previous slides had two protons, so that was helium. Uh, but carbon has six, and then six neutrons, so the two heavy things, if you add those up, you get 12. So that's a mass number of 12. What you can also have are isotopes. Isotopes are different variations of the same element. So each of these carbon-12, 13, and 14, have six protons and six electrons. What does differ is the neutrons. Notice carbon-14 has a mass number of 14 because it has eight neutrons. So when you add six and eight, you get 14. So that's the heaviest. Different number of neutrons. What's neat is some isotopes are called radioactive. So if you, uh, over time, watch elements as they sit uh, unactive, they'll slowly give off neutrons. And when radioactive isotopes do that, they release radioactivity. And we use that in tests. So PET scans, for example. Here's a PET scan. So what happens before you get in a machine is you uh, ingest radioactive uh, glucose. So some of the carbons in there are radioactive. And then you see where that goes. You can measure the radioactivity in areas. And so the parts of your brain that are using the most sugar are the ones that are the most active. So you can see how different parts of your brain are active during different activities. Uh, you can also use that to determine uh, if somebody has a tumor. Tumors are cancerous. Uh, if they're cancerous, they're going to be using lots more energy than the normal cells there. So they'll light up. An electron, uh, electron structure for each atom 
is going to determine how it interacts with other atoms and what kinds of bonds it forms. What you look at is you look at the number of the electrons in the electron shells. So they, they fill their shells in a specific order and they want to have a full outer shell. We'll look at how that works. So they always go to the inner shells first and then the outer. And uh, once this first one is filled, they go on to the second. Uh, and that's going to be dependent on how many electrons an atom has. So remember, an unreacted atom has the same number of protons as electrons. So right here, hydrogen, that's number one, has one proton, one electron. So in this first shell, it's got one empty space. It's going to want to share electrons with other atoms. Carbon has six. So first you fill out in the inner shell, so that's two. And then you have four for the next shell. That's four out of eight filled. That fact is so important to life. So carbon needs four electrons, it makes four bonds. Nitrogen has three open spaces, it makes three. Oxygen has two open spaces, it makes two bonds. So that's going to determine the type of molecules that can be made. The goal of every atom is to have its outer shell of electrons filled. So like helium, which has two electrons, its outer shell is full. It's very stable. That's what's called a noble gas. For everything else, they're going to do reactions. So the first type of bond that we can make is an ionic bond. So here's sodium. Sodium has two in its first shell, eight in its second, and one in its third. So to get a full outer shell, it can either lose one or gain seven. It's much easier to lose one. Whereas chlorine has two in its first, eight in its second, and seven out of eight in its third. So it can either lose seven or gain one. So what happens in an ionic bond is one atom gives the other an electron. So sodium gives chlorine an electron. And now what happens? We just took negative charge from sodium and gave it to chlorine. So chlorine gained an electron, it gained negative charge, so now it's called Cl minus. Sodium lost negative charge, so it's more positive, so it's Na plus. The plus is attracted to the negative, so you've got this strong pull. That's an ionic bond. So we've just made sodium chloride, NaCl. And those charged particles are called ions. Ions have a charge, Na plus, Cl minus. So it makes sense. Charged ions make ionic bonds. Covalent bonds means sharing. Both atoms want more electrons, so they share them. So like in this first one, H2 is hydrogen gas. Each hydrogen has one electron, so those electrons are going to be moving between the two. So at least part of the time, not always, each atom is going to have its outer shell filled. That's better than never. Same with oxygen. They share at two pairs now. So you'll have two pairs of electrons moving back and forth. What's neat is like water, you've got one bond and two. And these two atoms don't share the electron very evenly. Oxygen is called electronegative. It's an electron sucker. It's really selfish, so it'll be more likely to have the electron here. It'll be kind of negative, and that'll be important. We'll look at that later. And the last type is hydrogen bonds. These are the weakest. That's going to be based on that unequal sharing of hydrogen and oxygen in water we looked at before. So ionic covalent, very strong. Hydrogen, they're the weakest, but when you have them in really big numbers, they can be quite strong. So that's going to be like surface tension in water. If you do a belly flop, it hurts really bad. That's because of the hydrogen bonds. Okay, next, in the next video, we'll look at chemical reactions.